Well, welcome everybody. And in case um, you didn't hear the rehearsal, uh, my name is Colin Grant, <laughs> and uh, I'm very pleased in recent years to have got a proper job, one of the best employees I've ever had, actually, Margot. I'm the director of a new site called Writers Mosaic, which is a platform for new writing funded by the Royal Literary Fund. And I'm very pleed to be sitting beside Margot. I met you a few years ago a when years ago. I reviewed Margot's first book, uh, yes. Negro Land, The Guardian. Uh, Margot is a Pulitzer Prize winning critic. Um, constructing the nervous system, or constructing a nervous system, is her second memoir. The first memoir, which I read, was Negro Land, which is not so much a geographic location as a state of mind, an exclusive club with discernible borders to which few have ever belonged. I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> you and may think and you quite <laughs> accurately, too. Yes. Uh, Margaret's uh, won many, many awards, including recently, this year, the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize. Um, so congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so constructing a nervous system is a fierce, bold, trim, and richly rewarding book. It's marked by, I think, um, a kind of elegance and eloquence, which is also true of Negroland. And there's some lovely phrases that come up. Sometimes we're not sure whether they're your phrases or other, other people's phrases, but you bold when, ones that aren't yours. Normally. But I do do notes. You do notes as I well, do, yeah. I do notes, yeah. But there one, are some writers who very one, one of the One of the lovely lines, yeah. uh, the many, many lovely lines, but the, Ooh, the, the post-mortification <laughs> memory disorder. Is that one of yours? I believe that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It sort of oh, speaks I'm... to the unreliability of memory. Exactly. As well, yes, yeah. that was mine. All right. But we're going to begin by kind of, <laughs> kind of drilling down to the title. It's a lovely title, Constructing a Nervous System. And in the beginning of the book, you talk about the theme and the fact that you, for many, many years, in fact, all your life, have been working towards becoming a person of inner consequence. What is that? <sighs> oh, you would start with. Uh, I mean, with something that requires a certain, um, a certain modesty to deflect the high ambition of it. A person of inner consequence um, was, and this would have started really when I was a child, um, um, a person who combined charisma with rectitude, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Nice. Uh, a person who was never, which was something uh, I feared, both because I was vivacious, but also because I was a girl, um, was, never, was never a dilettante in any way, but mm -hmm. you know, took up and took on um, whatever the, mm -hmm. the, the discipline was, whatever the question was, whatever the experiment was. You, know, you, you took hold of it and you gave yourself. Mm. to it. Um, you were distinguished, to use a kind of 19th century male library mm. <laughs> word, right? It's a good word. It's a good word. Yeah, but it might, yeah. And you were, yeah, um, and you, you, you were compelling. You were and, compelling. And but, did you have any models in mind? Well, any, frankly, any compelling, any thrilling performer was a model for me. But I was always um, picking Picking up bits and pieces. Um, I write in Negroland about discovering Baldwin, which it appears everyone in the universe um, <laughs> has rediscovered again. <laughs> oh, fine, um, he deserves it. Um, but at the same time, those were also years when I was um, mesmerized by Judy Garland, um, yeah. by um, the Billie Holiday album, um, the one with strings. Mm. Um, Wait, what's your, Lady in Satin. Uh, mm. You know, again, that combination of something that was almost decadent but also heartbreaking um, and I I was always interested in people who um, slightly um, fractured the expectations of, of the style uh, when I first heard Billie Holiday consciously it mm. was really the fact that it wasn't a so-called which I write about with Nina Simone but it wasn't a so-called lyric it wasn't a woman's voice as i right. heard it it was some it was expressing something else mm. Um, mm. and you talked about the the thrum you want to hear a thrum <laughs> in your life what do you mean by a thrum uh, i like the sound of it uh, yeah. so it's it's um it it is something that's being motored but also is um has a certain gentleness to mm. it mm. Um, yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. What kind of resonance does that have, just, would you say? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sounds hymnal almost. Yeah, yeah. oh, it's oh, interesting. To me. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, I could see that. Well, I was intrigued by the notion of, of, con- of reconstructing your, your life in a way. Yeah. And there's a very famous poet, musician, Gil Scott Heron, who talked oh, about indeed. pieces of a man. Oh. So in a way, this book is pieces of a woman. Yes, indeed uh, it is. But also it's sort of um, moving pieces of a woman because you're kind of um, arguing with this kind of static nature of being defined in one way, aren't you? Yes, um, yes. <laughs> uh, that uh, being able to turn on the old cliche, to turn on a dime, you know, mm. and keep your balance um, like... You know, like dancers do if they're doing some, mm-hmm. you know, that, that combination of something that could be utterly spontaneous, but that you have worked for yeah, uh, yeah. is always mm-hmm. kind of thrilling to me. Yeah. So, so the nervous system is always doing certain things. That's mm-hmm. the stability. But if you're reconstructing it, that means you're also I'm not going to say deconstruct because we use that too often. Mm-hmm. You're taking it apart. You're, you know, mm-hmm. you're, it's, you're letting parts of it deteriorate even. Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you're also um, thinking about the, the central nervous system and, and the, or the sympathetic ner- nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system Ooh, as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, say more. <laughs> Please say more. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get into that a bit later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, you've kind of hinted all, already about the fact that um, you are conscious of how you present yourself. Um, and um, when I was reading your book... Not always in control of it, no, you know, but no. conscious of how one presents oneself and wants to be perceived. Yes. Well, um, I may have put the words wrong, but there's a sense that when you're a teenager, uh, you want to be both desirable and impeccable. Yeah, which is very difficult. Very difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yes. but why so? Why do you want to be both? Well, impeccable really had to do with that, um, you know, privileged, um, pleased to be rarefied um, yeah. world of the... Um, they would call themselves an upper class. We could call them, as E. Franklin Frazier did very cruelly, bourgeois, all right? That's all you are, you black people, you're bourgeois. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but we were taught, you know, we, we were supposed to represent mm-hmm. um, the race. Uh, we were the ones everyone was going... If, if we were the best, quote, unquote, um, that had been known and thought of black people in the world, which we deeply wanted to think we were, then um, everything we did, however small, um, Mm. had consequences. It could be interpreted, if it were less than impeccable, Mm. as um, a racial failure, a racial lack in the Mm. really deep sense of lack. Yeah, Yeah, so it's like a racial sacrament almost. Yes, 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 exactly. Um, That worked, uh, it certainly worked for the boys I grew up with, but it worked that, that combination, that nexus where racial impeccability and um, upper middle class female impeccability. I was born in 1947, so I was a a girl, pre-adolescent, girl, pre-adolescent, adolescent adolescent, um, in the 50s, early 60s, mid 60s is really where everything started to crack open. But, you know, the Mm. those formative years were, um, you know, real ideology. (laughs) Feminine, feminine (laughs) constraints (laughs) advertised as needs, necessities and desirabilities. But desirability um, also to me meant, again, I I keep mentioning this word charisma. It meant Mm. you could Yes, it, you wanted to be sexually desirable, but you wanted to be fascinating. Mm-hmm. I wanted, um, mm-hmm. you know, it might, some, the, the persona, that combination, of sensibility. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted a distinguished, a distinctive, I would have called it, not distinguished as a, as a mm-hmm. girl, sensibility. So I, sense wanted to be ta- sensibility. I wanted to be talented. And you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uber talented, uber talented. It does resonate with me, and the rest, I'm sure it would resonate with anybody who's got a Caribbean background, and there are a few friends of, from the Caribbean in the household tonight. Um, so when I was growing up in, in a, a fine place called Luton, which is the capital of Britain, uh, <laughs> 30 miles from here with the Caribbean family, uh, I, I had this uh, uh, very fierce father who said, you're being watched. You're being watched. Yes. You're being watched by the white people then to see which way you turn, to see whether you conform to their stereotype that they have of you, of being feckless, work shy, destined for a life of crime. So you're being much so bella figura, show your best face to the world. Oh. Is that the kind of thing that you yeah. were growing up Yes, with? but you know, it's interesting. Yours really does have those particularities of 
but manhood yeah, and yeah. manhood, you know, and yeah. how it's judged and how it's found wanting. Um, so, you know, my the female stereotypes would have been they certainly they expect they don't expect you to be distinguished. They expect you yeah. to be um, to be lewd as opposed to yeah. sexy and desirable to mm. be um, compulsively sensuous and lewd. Um, well, and they're going to tend to think that, you know, basically you're, you're made for hard labor. Well, you know, you're, mm. you just don't have what it takes, even if you're sitting there in that little school yeah. to be, you know. So you have to confound that expectation. Yes, at, so. all, at all times, mm. yeah. No. I remember there, when I was growing up, I, I took it for granted. I was little, but I now realize it was um, many, many white people um, or small groups of white people in this school I was going to. Or if we'd go shopping, let's say, in Marshall Fields or Sac, and someone would hear me talking and this total white stranger would say to my mother, your little girl speaks so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure my mother was thinking, well, yes, I did. <laughs> that yeah. I was teaching her to do that just mm. so you'd have to. But you know, it's presumptuous, wasn't mm. it? But yeah. it can be a bit tiring, can't it? Being on display in that way. Yes. I suppose. Tiring or, you know what I thought I heard you say, it can be a tyrant. Oh, it can be. And it can be both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> tiring yeah, yeah, yeah. and a tyrant. But there's a lot of joy and fun and love in your book as well. And uh, the book is populated with many, many people who admire, a lot of performers, yes, and yes, sometimes yes. in a way that you wouldn't expect. Um, and they range from Ella Fitzgerald to... And Bud Powell. And Bud Powell. And I was, I was going to begin with Bud Powell. Oh, okay. Um, to Ike Turner. You were going to say that word. I actually was, was going to say Ben, ben Crosby. Well, ben Crosby. Well, 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 we'll That's get to, right. We'll get to yes. him, so we'll oh, get to yeah. him in a bit. Yeah. But let's, let's begin with uh, Bud Powell, <laughs> who uh, was this wonderful jazz musician, oh. pianist, oh. Uh, yes, and, and composed, and composer. composer too, but yeah, always a pianist, yeah. Free jazz sometimes as well? Or Close early? too, not, yeah. not, you know, really bop, but yeah. he could do some very strange yeah. and wonderful things, yeah. yeah. And um, had a bit of a tortured life. Very many, um, we, now we would say, as we say of so many, um, you know, there might have been schizophrenia, but it could certainly have been bipolar, but mm. he started um, self-medicating, um, mm. drugs, liquor, very early on. Fragile um, nervous mm. system breakdowns. Um, mm. uh, he, you know, like so many black musicians of that period, um, you know, they were always under surveillance by the police yeah. at mm. their club. Um, he took a beating, I think. It, no, yeah. maybe it was. No, he did, took did, a did, beating yeah, for who was he was taking a beating from for? The Someone else who had drugs. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that story. But he definitely took beatings anyway. Not to mention the um, unenlightened mental institutions that he also spent yeah. time in. Yeah. Um, he genuinely with wonderful names like Bellevue. Yeah. <laughs> Bellevue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you write off him, this j jazz musician. Yeah. You wanted to find out what was it like to blaze and blast through unsanctioned states of mind. So what is a sanctioned state of mind and what's an unsanctioned state of mind? Right, well a sanctioned state of mind would be all the proprieties um, and necessities um, that we have been speaking of. Um, crudely put, a sanctioned state of mind might be what your father and my parents wanted and the unsanctioned the unsanctioned would be what they feared we would become, oh, these yeah. wild, tempestuous, lewd creatures, but um, made made whole in some way. Uh, mm. I don't want to say redeemed, but it's pop, by art, by having that genius. Mm. So you can take those risks and mm. wander, you know, um, into the ugly and the perverse um, mm. and find beauty in them and then find your way to mm. um, other kinds, you know, to more, to, he could, Bud Powell could do, you know, what we think of as the most luminous kind of lyricism and then these discordant chords, you know, that we mm. just, I, I talk about... Um, he worked on Round Midnight, didn't he? Yeah, uh, uh, he, did he did great versions of that. Mm. Um, but I talk about one song, oh God, Errol Garner, what's that, um, that sweet, uh, the, that he made such a hit of? Oh, Anyway, it's a very... So it was written as a waltz, and um, you know it's always a romance song, and Bud Powell just <laughs> breaks it up, you know, and, and gives you strange um, pauses and insistences where you didn't expect, and then it, it's it's mm. something else. And you write with a lot of um, misty, misty. Well done. You know, you know that. You look the... at yeah. me, you know, and what's going on? <laughs> I'll look at you, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I was going to say, you write with a lot of uh, pathos and compassion about him, because there's one story you tell about him, him being incarcerated and his, his 
sketched out the keys, the keys on the on the wall. Piano keys on the wall, yeah. and a, and friends or a friend come in um, because the story comes from them, and he says, "Listen, listen to these chords. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these chords?" Um, but I also say, "Don't pity him." You know, mm -hmm. there's something gorgeous about yeah, yeah, that. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's patronizing to pity people, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think so. Yes, it yeah. is. I was, I was having a bit of an argument with my editor about um, a phrase that she didn't understand. I love my editor, by the way, if you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that there's no pity in much. history. There's no pity in history. That is, Boom. No, that is true. That's how we live. And it is, I was talking about this with someone the other day because I'd done an interview mm. um, with um, someone who kept saying, she kept coming back to this, um, oh, it must have been so painful, um, <laughs> you know, to to be a young black woman when the highest standards of beauty mm. were, were white. What was that like? That must have been so painful. I was so angry. Um, mm. <laughs> so why do you keep asking? No. <clears throat> um, I didn't do it. I, I, I got back, but I didn't get my own back fully. But I thought afterwards, that is the, you know, that kind of manufactured Pity, that kind of almost glorying in the fact that you have the power to pity mm. Um, mm. Is, is a really, it's a go-to stance for many people mm. um, whenever they're faced with an other, you mm. know, whom they've been taught to feel is less, but have been suddenly this person is in front of them and isn't less. So then you really have to amp up mm. <laughs> you know, the pity. So I'm not a great singer. I'm just going to give the line, and you're going to give the other line, right? Okay. So I give to you. And you give to me true love. True love. So, Bing Crosby. Uh, Bing Crosby, uh, by contrast from Bud Powell, became a personal minstrel man for you. Uh, what is a personal minstrel man? Personal minstrel man is, um, well, you, most of you, I'm sure, know something about the, the, the black minstrel show, the minstrelsy of the 19th century. Um, yes, there were some black performers who became actually great artists who did it, but, you know, basically, backface makeup, some actually interesting songs and dances, but all performed in this kind of grotesque, <laughs> broad, um, mm. you know, with nothing we would call um, inventive um, black vernacular, just shattered, <laughs> broken, shattered grammar um, delivered in a way that signals, I am so stupid, that's why I'm doing this work. So, but the minstrel show was hugely, hugely, um, as an entertainment foundation, it was, it, uh, it was wildly popular. And that is partly because um, the, the vitality um, and in some ways complexity and this kind of incandescence of the black materials it was based on, which were songs, which were rhythms, which were dance, um, early forms of popular dance, they mesmerized people, as did something about um, black tonalities mm. um, and, and something about even being able to just fuck up the language. Fuck with it. And in some way be, come, come up with some kind of sonic interest or, mus or uh, musicality. So um, a minstrel, as I defined it, is basically um, a figure that bears some weight in the culture, has some presence, who is in many ways that matter to you um, inadequate, um, shallow, um, maybe even contemptible. Um, but uh, has license to, to do things and claim things that mm. you don't. So, um, you know, in one's perpetual um, <laughs> gendered and raced um, competitiveness with um, those who are mm. white, uh, with white, white heterosexual men who are totally mm. powerful, um, I claimed Bing Crosby. I realized I was kind of fascinated by him, and mm. I thought, okay, he's, a, you know, this constant benignness, mm. this oleaginous, you know, sort of <laughs> a baritone singing. Then he would drop into, because he had grown up admiring Louis Armstrong and Big Spider-Man, then he'd sort of drop into a little jive talk, you know, and then <laughs> yeah. he'd 
go back. Yeah. And he was one of the most popular stars in America. Um, yeah. And had great yeah. longevity, didn't he? He had great longevity. He sang um, White Christmas with David Bowie one year. Did he? Yes. Wow. David Bowie said, I did it for my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. And he sang with Elvis Presley. You know, he was mm. getting himself. Yeah, 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 so yeah. I liked this idea of um, ways in which a, a black woman could ha kind of have a menstrual. If Condoleezza Rice had been president, not that we would have wanted her to, and George Bush, you know, who was a goofus in many ways, as well as a war criminal, but I mean, the manner is, I was a cheerleader, I'm a southern boy. If she had been president and he'd been um, in her family, he'd have been her menstrual. Um, and Bing Crosby was mine. So, you know, it was a, it was a power grab. Mm -hmm. It was a power grab. So yeah. Congress... And I said, I said that I thought Oprah, you had Dr. Phil, you know, yeah, whenever, yeah, yeah. whenever you're, a, you know, um, a person, a woman, a black woman with greater power who can pluck out, mm. employ, and help shape the persona mm. and present thing, you've got, of a white man, you've got a man's draw. Oh, it's interesting because uh, we have a version of in, in Pretty Patel, I think. In, in, that, in the sense that uh, you have a problem with Condoleezza, don't you? Because on the one hand, she says in her biography, um, this is a great country where you can't buy a hamburger, but you, you can become but you the can president. Become pre but you say that's not true. No, of course it's not. Of course it's not. We know. That. No, she was a, you know, she was um, a shameful creature. Of Somebody's problem. coming in, incoming, oh, incoming. Oh, oh, like I'm losing my microphone. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Where did where did I leave off? So it's, <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it, when you have a person like Condoleezza Rice? Because on one hand, you want to celebrate her. You one would prefer to uh, initially, and then there's a certain pleasure in hating her because it does <laughs> mean yeah. that you are not fooled by the rigidities and pieties that she stands for that do do have a lot to do with um, how you, that's me, um, you know, um, were raised. Mm. You know, so to, so to be able to turn a cold eye, you know, on a product much like yourself and mm. to feel smug that, of course, <laughs> you've diverged from that. Yeah. Uh, but, the, you know, the, she, she became someone that she was, her politics made her rather grotesque and everything. Mm, mm. Yeah. But you saw her very clearly, I think. Um, yeah. Now, listen, you've written a memoir which is reliant on, on memory. Yes, and but mem memories, so many memories of so many others. Yeah, yeah. But, but also we know from the 1930s, through psychologists, that every time you access a memory, you subtly fictionalize it. Yes. Uh, and you can't really rely on it. No, that's absolutely uh, and, But right. you say about memory and yeah. your book, I will decorate the deprivations. Can, can, oh, what do you mean yeah. by that? Can you explain what you mean by um, that? Yes. Um, uh, partly I took it, I t was taking a jump from, um, as I do with so many um, artists in this book, from, um, Zora Neale Hurston's oh, essay, yeah. Characteristics of Negro Expression. Uh, and she has um, one passage where she says, oh, you know, um, often, you know, you'll walk into, it's, um, you know, a, a home, a working class Negro's home, and it'll be wildly decorated and elaborate, and you'll think, oh, well, this is, this is kind of in bad taste. And then you realize, no, it's another aesthetic. It's decorating a decoration. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's a kind of sumptuousness in, mm. the, in the aesthetic. And um, I always was tickled by that. Um, mm. But I don't think of myself um, as a writer, as, you know, constantly surrounded by um, um, and emerging from this, 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 this gallery of sumptuous imagery, which I think is the phrase I yeah. use, that my memory isn't stocked with that, and constant lyric invention. Um, so I thought, okay. Um, one of the things that interests me as a critic over the years has been um, watching artists um, not only work with what we know their talents are, but mm. also find a way to work with, through, against what they don't do as well. You know, um, oh, oh, you're like, again, Holiday would be a very good example. Good that range was tiny, um, mm. you know, and she found um, ways to make it by this, this ridiculous ambition in a funny way, you could say. I wanted Bess Bessie Sound and uh, Louis Soul, something like that. And she found her way. Ella Fitzgerald, on the other hand, had a voice that could do virtually mm. anything um, what she lacked was um, that 
that female feminine charisma that mm. was so necessary mm. for stars mm. to become a star, however talented you were mm. in that period. And mm. God damn it, if she didn't. It's tricky though also because as a young woman, you didn't really admire the, the hefty, no, I did, I sweaty did not. It, Ella Fitzgerald. I, I did not because the, mm. um, the, the Ella whom you heard on record, whether she was scatting wildly, you know, and, you, and leaving her a very good male musicians kind of going, whoa, you know, um, or doing one of those lovely, it's the Gershwin songbook, you know, those kind of limpid, mm. lovely things. Um, Whatever she was doing, you know, it was, um, God, I just lost myself describing her. Well, um, now wait, oh, but yes. Yeah. So that had, a, that had total perfection yeah. um, of, 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 you know, it was romantic, it was sly, it was witty, um, yeah. you know, it was, um, had a kind of sweet abandon when mm. she did something. Yeah, when mm. she did certain style ballads. But to see her um, was to not be able to, you know, be immersed yeah. in this... Um, Lena Horn, like um, mm. I mean, I'll do, I'll pick another black singer or Dorothy Dandridge, like it was to see this hefty, um, mm. matronly, um, decorous in a way that wasn't thrilling, you mm. know, nicely mannered um, person, and and to be to be thrown off. Um, why? Partly because um, you know, as well as she comported herself and mm. as nicely as she dressed. Um, the, the heft mm. um, and the um, short, often straightened hair, um, mm. to me, signaled things that black women and mm. black people wanted to improve in themselves or kind of keep mm. hidden. Mm. And, how and so she would sweat, you mm. know, and then I would worry, first of all, women uh, performers in those days, except in you know, if you were um, if you were a blues singer in a funky club, if you were mainstream and on TV, you weren't supposed to sweat if you were a woman. Mm. Maybe you purse fight. No, you really weren't. Uh, maybe you purse fight. You were wearing. You were armored and bound and wrapped. You know, in some gown. Mm. You know, with the bus freaking <laughs> up. Um, you know, when you had this little gal gallery gallery of gestures that were supposed mm. to be mm. provocative <laughs> and expressive. Yeah. Um, so no, but there she was. So. Ella, like Louis Armstrong, um, mm. she worked so hard, you know, despite, you listen to her on the record and it's, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, it's so, she worked so hard that, yes, in front of us, she had to pull out that white handkerchief and wipe the yeah. sweat off. And as she, and I, oh, you know, it yeah. really, but it, it a really, you know, because it was, it mm. became, um, you know, it was like a trope of black female labor. Mm. Yeah, the men could get away with it. Louis Armstrong, that's fine. Absolutely. That's absolutely. He's always there with the handkerchief as well, isn't he? Yes, mm. yes, yes. And I wonder if in some ways, because they, they worked together a lot, they sang mm. together a lot, and Ella was a great mimic, and she's always oh. mimicking Louis mm. and other male singers as well as mm. Um, mm. instrumentals, etc. I wonder if in some ways she mm. thought, okay, I'll mm. do that. And in her, by the 60s, she's made it um, gesturally compelling. Mm. You know, mm. she doesn't just dab anxiously, as she did in the 50s or very early 60s on TV, you see her dabbing at the perspiration. Mm. Um, mm. No, and then it became um, performative. Mm. You know? um, well, I feel very humbled by your book because also I had a very sort of limited idea about Ella Fitzgerald. I didn't know that she'd been put in a reform school as a young knew girl. knew nothing about uh, this. And she didn't talk she about it. She never talked about it. And that kind of... Um, you, one could call it reticence, which makes it sound as if, you know, maybe, maybe she was shy about it, embarrassed, whatever. It's also a deliberate withholding. Mm. I'm not, which I really admire, I'm not going to give you this yeah. raw material to mm. do with mm. as you will. You mm. know, I'm, I'm giving you a lot, but mm. it's exactly what I've chosen. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's interesting that because there's a phrase again in the Caribbean, you'll hear it. If you go to the Caribbean, you hear it all the time. Me don't like people chat my business. 
<laughs> and you know, she I could she did a couple of fake Caribbean songs. She, she did. She? Yes, yes. I can't remember which one, but I I I just am seeing seeing that as a song with that little voice of hers. Mm. Say it again. We don't like people chat my business. It's very musical too. It's insistent and musical. Yeah. We, a, we don't. Applause? Nothing? No. <laughs> oh. Are we getting here? Come That's on. right. Except Come you're on. putting yourself out for these people. This is home counties Luton. <laughs> now, there's some brilliant uh, uh, personalities and some brilliant uh, analysis of the personalities. Um, and I'm very fascinated by the, the way that you handle the relationship between Ike and Tina Turner. Um, uh, because, in a way, she outclassed him. Oh, she? God, totally. Yeah. And, he, and you be careful of what you wish. I mean, he must, must have wished for her, but actually he didn't really want her. No. And again, in Jamaica, we say, want it, want it, can't get it, have it, have it, don't want it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but there's a very interesting passage where you talk about the, the models that she had in mind for how she would live her life. And she's a young woman, and kind of a Jacqueline Kennedy kind of model. And there's a line about the, the fact that the daughters of the principals of schools uh, would also have that model in mind. And, and in this question I'm putting to you now, it's about the meta writing. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you uh -huh. write in the book that I considered leaving out this passage about Where, the principal's daughter's world. The, and they were all, of course, she was at an all-black school in the South, so they were all the black principals and doctor's daughters. Yeah, yeah. so, so they're high, high class. Right. Or high yellow or whatever. High, that, yes. Or the ones who weren't high yellow were wishing they were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. So why would you consider leaving out that passage then? Um, because, you know, in a way that is... I worried that it, it might be my version mm -hmm. of a kind of boastful, um, mm. almost pity, mm. yeah, as I was talking about earlier with that woman, that suddenly taking the spotlight away mm. from her and reminding the reader, well, you know, what, what she wanted was to be mm. what I came from. Well, uh, I, I... And then I thought, well... But it's an interesting passage, you know, yeah, because yeah. it also shows all the ways in which there's Jackie Kennedy. There are these unnamed, you know, local <laughs> um, debutantes, you know, and then there's, you know, she gets shot. There's Mick Jagger, whom she influences and then proceeds to mm. steal a little bit from. So I thought, no, it, you know, the making, mm. the making of someone is always interesting. But I thought I can't put it in unless I acknowledge Mm. Um, that not only did I worry about it, but that I was right to worry about it, mm. <laughs> at least to, you know, be scrupulous about yes, it. Yes, absolutely. Well, you're scrupulous also about uh, not capitalizing the word black. And um, I wondered why you did that. I mean, I, I'm, I was delighted to read that, <laughs> I must say, because I have a bit of a bugbear about the capitalization of black. You know, and um, the, it's interesting that you said scrupulous, because I think I, I did it and I chose to do it, but I chose not to focus in my own head on I'm doing this. Um, I do get, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have, I don't want to have to capitalize whites or blacks, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, in my um, generation, and, you know, my generation did a lot of dumb things, but what we, we kind of popularized, late 60s, we brought black as a term mm. to the fore. Front. And some okay, periodically it was capitalized, but on the whole, we didn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm comfortable with that. I see why African American is capitalized, mm -hmm. but um, no, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I also, in some points, uh, some points of the book, uh, some places in the book, you know, I I use Negro when it is historically appropriate, when mm -hmm. it's how someone would have been described mm -hmm. at the time or mm -hmm. how they were presenting themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do. Mm. And you're confident about that? You don't worry about any kind of trolling? No, like of course it. I worry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, calling a book Negro Land. Um, I know, you know, you're brave. A number of, but you know, I had friends who call me up and say, I can't be seen reading it on the sub. <laughs> <laughs> that title. Uh, you know, but, but you're so right. I wanted it to convey um, mm. an entire mm. world. Also, it, it is interesting, the, the lineage of um, language, the yeah. words, the names for mm. people mm. who run the gamut from being discriminated against to violently oppressed. These, the terms are always unstable, mm. even amongst ourselves, you know, mm. because we're mm. always mm. combating this, staying ahead of that, claiming you know, mm -hmm. something, some new new territory. Mm -hmm. So I I thought, let, let's have them, I thought with Negro Land as well as with this, let's have them all exist in mm -hmm. that um, 
set of sequences, sometimes jumbles, that mm. they exist in our lives. Mm. Because also, I think when you capitalize the word black, you reify the word mm -hmm. and you racialize somebody immediately. Their blackness precedes them. Well, ah, that's true. And I, 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 I was yeah. always well, brought up with the idea that eventually, um, People won't see your colour, they'll just see your character. So the idea that we're now reasserting our colour first, and that's what you are, is anathema to me. Ah, uh, no, it isn't it isn't fully anathema to me in that way because I again it was being, mm. you know, um mm. in my in 18, 19, 20, 21 in the black power sure, movement. Sure. I, yeah, yeah. And I don't mean I saw Angela Davis's uh, book over there. I don't mean I, I was I was a leader or a star, but so you know, that still feels mm. it felt important and and um, bold and and claiming something that had been mm -hmm. seen you know kind of lurking in mm -hmm. you know in, in darkness and ugliness um, mm -hmm. and oh the black you know, yeah. um, oh. so mm -hmm. I, I still I still like that um, but mm -hmm. I don't want to be utterly bound by it yeah. Well, there's so many good things in this book. And by the way, everybody must buy a copy. I'll be watching when we leave. <laughs> uh, this is the, I, I, I was saying earlier to Margot that um, I read the book once because I had to come here and interview, but the second time for and pleasure. And you had agreed to. No, 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 no I had agreed to. No, but I, I agreed okay. to it willingly, actually. I mean, no, but reading uh, it I was, I was delighted time. by it. I mean, also for the second time, I was reading for things I could steal, obviously. Oh, I love it. Uh, so, yeah. you do that. We do that, don't we? We steal. Yeah. That's right. Borrowing. Yeah, appropriating. <laughs> yeah. um. Now, but when you do this kind of writing um, and this kind of memoir writing, sometimes things appear or you learn things that you weren't familiar with before you started writing. Now, there's a very fine woman, Janice Kingslow, Kingslow yes. uh, who was an actor. She was a very um, lovely. She started as a, she was a woman of color. Um, she would have said, I guess, since she would have been about my mother's age, Negro um, mm. for most of those years. She was um, an actress. She was progressive. She did, uh, she um, worked with a group called the um, W.E.B. Du Bois Players, a theater mm -hmm. group in Chicago. She was very gorgeous, I will say this again. Um, she was also very light-skinned. She successfully performed um, in a play called Anna Lucasta that was, you know, one of those staples for black cast. Mm -hmm. Everybody did, every generation they did Anna Lucasta. Um, and Hollywood came calling and mm -hmm. they were very impressed. Um, she was the real deal. But their deal was, um, we will make a star out of you. You will have to agree to pass for white. Mm -hmm. And she did say no. She may not even have said no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and she went back. Uh, to Chicago, where she had grown up, and did theater work, and did um, some consulting, um, civil rights. Well, civil rights in the sense of, well, how can we work um, moderately progressive views about Negroes and, and uh, other diverse peoples into our radio shows? Uh, but she did this. Um, you know, she was making an honorable life for herself. Um, she got blacklisted because of her leftist views. She not unlike Bud Powell, it wasn't the drinking and drugs, but she really had a serious nervous breakdown. Mm. And she, the blacklisting kind of set it, set it off. And mm. she um, disappeared for some years. It really just, a, a, you know, a career, a presence um, mm. snuffed out. Um, one, um, I had not mentioned that in fact, she had been a friend of my mother's when they were when they were young sorority girls. One day, my mother and a group of her friends were having lunch, and a woman whom they described as you know, pale and kind of wan-looking and very severe um, in manner and um, a little timorous came mm. up to them, and she said she knew all of them. They'd all been, you know, college mm. sorority girls, or whatever. She said, "You don't remember me. None of you remembers me, do you?" Looked to all these lunching mm. ladies, the ladies mm. who lunch, and she said, I'm Janice Kingsley. Because simultaneously, the sense of this tragic life, but also the sense of how they had the knowledge that they had not kept up with her. Mm. Um, mm. And my mother did tell me this story, and she was aware um, of, mm. of all of that. Um, and, there's a point and she mode. said, um, mm -hmm. I think she said, I hate waste. Mm. And, but she didn't say it as if she were angry at Janice. It was an existential comment. I hate 
the waste no. of, of, of talent, of skill, of mm -hmm. beauty, mm -hmm. um, that um, as a particular black woman mm -hmm. at a particular point in American history, I, I'd say in the book, history does have time for, it is, they are making time for themselves and history is being forced to make time for her descendants, but history had no time for her, mm -hmm. it really did. There's a little line in the book where you point out the fact that your father was part of yes. an, an organization who well, had employed her. If this, this is true, and it's in the book, and I was debating with myself as mm. I told this story. Well, we get to that, but I actually thought, Colin will get to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw that. Yes. Uh, yeah. You did, okay. Yeah. Um, my mother did not tell me this part of the story. I found it out when I was researching Janice King's love for the book and found the articles she'd written, etc., cetera, um, from the mental institution. But one of the jobs she'd had, and then I remember it, was doing press, doing public relations for Provident Hospital, which was the black hospital in Chicago that um, for some years my father was head of pediatrics at. And I calculated dates-wise that um, she said she was let go and no one told her why. And I calculated dates-wise that he would have been at that hospital when that happened. Was he her direct employer? No, but he was, you know, we know about blacklisting. Mm -hmm. He would have been um, complicitous. Did my mother know? I don't know. But what would, at most, she might have said, oh, what a shame, Ronald. I, you know, I mm. wish you could be otherwise. So that's, mm. yeah, I, there, that's a terrible moment when, I, when it hits yeah, me, yeah. but there yeah, you yeah. are. Because then the yeah. dilemma, do you include it or not? I yes, and that I had to include. It would have been, mm. I would have felt so scummy yeah. if I hadn't. And I thought, oh, well, if my mother remembers that, then that's part of I hate waste, too. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Now, that what, I perpetuate. Um, there the are lots of uh, writers who I don't know about who have You've now introduced me to in the book. Oh, I don't um, believe that. Well, I didn't know Willa, Willa Carter. Oh, Miss the, the, Americana. Yeah, no, she's, she, is, she is really a major American writer, but she okay. hasn't quite she's made... She's not yeah. crossed over the Atlantic. Mm, apparently not quite. Well, no. the book that you focus on, The Song of the Lark, uh, which is a luminous portrait of a Midwestern American girl becoming an opera singer. Yeah, based on a true story. Yeah, you know, immigrant, uh, European immigrant, mm. working class. And, and you clearly immigrant. admire this writer in the book. But, and the book also has this feeling of a kind of, you know, it, it's not like like Joyce, Portrait of the Artist. It's more like a 19th century epic, mm. but it feels like Portrait of the Artist as a young, growing woman. And we're always looking um, as women for those kinds of texts, whether it's Cather or Adrian Kennedy. Mm. But you know. say you also, because of your admiration, but you also wanted to expose the rapture stirred by Cather in her heroine's white skin. Yes, these scan these white... What is that rapture? What does the rapture signify? The rapture signified, you know, it's, it's part of a whole web um, of assumptions, presumptions. The book is very much about America, partly through this singer, but also in the world around her, of classical music developing, of museums, of, you know, the Midwest trying to live up to New York, which is trying to live up to Paris and London. Um, so it's very much about how you build um, a, quote, major civilization. And every time um, between the white skin worship, there are many, many just rapturous passages and um, some racial allusions, um, not least um, to a black musician um, based on a real former slave um, kind of genius, genius musician. Um, she'd heard and reviewed as a young woman when this black musician um, shows, all right, I'm going too much on the plot. Uh, every, but every time, um, anything to do with black culture um, or, or, or just as by association, low, you know, the kind of low, low life um, of America. Every time it comes up, um, she gets squeamish and punitive um, mm. as opposed to expansive and generous, which is what she loves to do when she's writing about um, opera. So, you know, what I tried to do, I called it a procedural um, mm. because I was thinking about, first of all, the fact that I taught it without emphasizing that for some time, and then I realized I can't do this anymore. No, 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 no. So I called it a procedural, meaning, um, you know, I researched all the reviews she had written that had to do with black music, like the way Dvorak uses um, spirituals, um, which I found a review in which she basically said, well, 
mm, they were little slave songs and they're nice, but this isn't really what he's doing. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's doing something, something loftier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, so I did all of that. I found um, passages um, describing black classical musicians in other novels of hers. I didn't just, you know, meld them all together, you know, in some tapestry of guilt. I, I documented everything. You know, this, this is the procedural. <laughs> this is the case. Here's the evidence um, for how um, a major um, writer who could think and feel and... and put this into prose um, in, in striking ways. I mean, she has that. Really could not, not, not break through, get mm -hmm. past, even feel that it was necessary to entertain um, mm -hmm. this other mm -hmm. American material mm -hmm. and substance. Um, so at the, end so that, of, at the end of this procedural, what's the verdict then? The verdict is um, she's guilty. Uh, <laughs> guilty of race crimes, um, but she is... Still, this, mm. this is still a fascinating book, all the more so in some ways, were I ever to teach it again, you know, if I could really find the yeah. structure that mm. revealed all of that. Mm. Um, so the verdict is, you know, not throw her out. Um, mm. You know, Toni Morrison wrote about, ah, how, I'm sure a number of you have read I'm Playing in the Dark. Yeah. Yeah. Toni Morrison writes about Cabot's last novel and mm. her worst, um, which of course involves slavery. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but very interestingly, I felt it was, it was harder for me, aside from not being Toni Morrison, this book was better than Sephira and the Slave Girl, you know, it seemed to me. So, you know, yeah. you had to, contending forces. Yeah, The absolutely. contending forces. Well, what's great about the book is that there are contending forces in the book. Yes. And, and you are arguing with yourself, you're working things out. Um, yeah. And yeah. you're bringing some strange uh, people together, which I thought was fantastic. So you bring together George Eliot and W.E.B. Du Bois. But this is because... Go on, yeah, why? Right. It's, 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 I it's, found... it's the platform. <laughs> <laughs> That's your cue. Take off! <laughs> 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 okay, go for it. Okay. Um, is this still? Yeah, yeah, it's sliding down. Okay. That um, is because one, uh, I was rereading, I think I must have been rereading Du Bois, um, and I suddenly thought, wait a minute, this is reminding me of um, a George Eliot um, mm. story called The Lifted Veil. 1859. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought, interesting let me just put them both together and see what prose mm -hmm. echoes um adaptations alterations or maybe i'm making it up um but i wasn't um did du bois du bois kept very meticulous records of his um reading of course he would um it's not there um did he read it i do not know or i kind of um, you know, and say, well, you know, or maybe she was intuiting, um, you know, something she never wrote, um, something from a male point of view again. She never wrote a kind of gothic supernatural tale again. Um, so, you know, maybe it's like her getting an inside heck, heck um, a white woman's Afrofuturistic vision of some sort. Um, but what, what I do basically is, is make a dialogue, a yeah. kind of... Um, yeah. yeah, dialogue of these passages and how they resonate and mm. speak to each other. And mm. well, then I send them off together, you know, for a brief turn in a gilded ballroom, which he writes about also. In, um, so uh, my takeaway from that was that she wrote The Lizard Veil in 1859. Yeah. He wrote The Souls of Black Folk in 1903. 1903, right. And so Du Bois was lifting the veil <laughs> on, on black people through having read George Eliot. <laughs> lifting the veil on, because that book, it's a male narrator, who, you know, once he gets this strange second sight, because it is supernatural, all he is hearing is the fatuities, the, yeah. the ignorances, the stupidities, um, the venalities of all of the well-heeled, well-brought-up white people around him. Yeah. yeah. And you, you, so I think that's it. I think yeah, you, and right. so they would have made a, a handsome couple. Now, I've run on and on, and, on and, I've, and I haven't seen the nod that was going to give me the, the signal to open it up to the crowd. Um, <laughs> to invite the audience to pose one or two questions. So um, I wasn't hog the floor and hog you. So I'm going to invite people to uh, pose a question. We've only got about 10 minutes, I think. Uh, to um, What would you want to ask um, Margot? Any, any questions? One of the, when, while we're waiting for that, one of the key I, people that you, um, you focus on is, is uh, Josephine Baker. 
who's, yeah. who's a fabulous, who wants to know about Josephine Baker and what, what, what Margot thinks about her? Before we, can we just move that back up again? Oh, I'm going to move it That's back up again. That's such a good scarf. But it's a great scarf, but not for the microphone. Slippery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I've got a question from the galaxy. Uh, okay, fair enough. Is it to do with the Josephine yes. Baker? Yeah. Um, but it could be, yeah, it could be anything. It better be Almost. a good one. You you want Josephine? You want you yeah you want us to both talk about Josephine? Whilst we're waiting, do you think of your questions that will come subsequently? Okay, from Rachel McLennan. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which planet, but um, really enjoying this discussion. I hope this isn't a boring question, but I'm curious about whether Margot Jefferson prefers a work being described as memoir rather than autobiography, and if so why that is. Thank you. Hmm. I think of, and I, I want to know what you think mm. of too, um, I think of memoir as um, somewhat more looser and more free form in the way it yeah. chooses, yeah. To, chooses the materials of the life. Um, autobiography uh, seems to bear the weight of, um, you know, a sort of more formal chronological yeah. often, uh, feeling that you must all really detail, you know, there must be a kind of logical, almost realistic arc. Now, I'm not being fair um, about all autobiographies, but memoir, to my mind, gives you more, just more room. It can be short, it can be longer, it can digress, it can focus really on, you know, maybe five years of your life, nothing else. And it, it can... It can and it admits more freely, even when it doesn't say it directly, um, that memory is invention yeah. as much as it is, yeah. you know, lived and, experience. And it relies on evocation. It's not saying it's verifiable truth. This is my best memory. Of it. That's right. Me evocation. Trying to conjure. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Oh. So I think I, I definitely want it to be called. Memoir. Well, I right. guess you chose. I did, I did. Uh, yeah. And often I'll throw words in front of it, like cultural memoir, yeah. Or, uh, but yeah. And there's a question in front of you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you both very much. Um, so a question sort of popped into my head as soon as you both started speaking, um, because um, Colin, you were talking about um, the words in bold in Margot's book. Mm. And I'm interested in this idea of your words or someone else's. And I kind of, I've been thinking about this a lot recently and I kind of have this sense that in a way it feels to me like it's like an, an integral part of black cultural expression that we listen to each other, we speak in chorus, we're constantly kind of thinking in chorus with other thinkers and writers. And to me that feels like a very kind of natural, might sound like a charged word, but just something to, to celebrate and enjoy and, and kind of move within and I'm curious as to whether now in your perhaps in the publishing process or the editing process whether you ever come up against um, situations whereby that's not necessarily fully understood and I'm asking that as someone who at the moment is working in an academic sphere where there's an absolute obsession yeah. with kind of quoting or kind of accounting for um, the you mean quotes as forms of, of, of yeah, authority? Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 verifying yeah. Verifying. Yeah, I feel like it's it. absolutely fair, obviously, to acknowledge yeah. other people's work. But I also think that there's something much more fluid that we do um, in our music, in our thinking, and our art, where we're constantly in conversation with each other. And I just wondered if you could speak a bit more about that in your own writing, mm. um, please. Um, I can't... Um, Call, there is call and response, yeah. Yes, and there's also that um, accretion, for example, you know, say in, in blues songs, you know, you'll have um, <laughs> the same lines, but then there'll be a slight mm. twist um, mm. in so-and-so's version. You know, she, Bessie ended the line, the, you know, the, the, that way, but Clara Smith, mm. you know, you're all getting on a train and riding, but <laughs> that last line is different. So there's, you know, you take the material and then particularly as a performer, you mark it, but as a writer, you can, you can do the same. Yeah, and, and we do. It's something I think that um, black scholarship for many years focused on more in terms of what, um, oral culture, vernacular culture. Now, I think you know, we are seeing it in, um, 
in black literature and written, you know, in literature, written literature, in um, you know, the legacies of of um, theater. Uh, you're seeing now; it's understood that um, this is not merely a folk practice. It's all, it, you know, it's a cultural um, um, history and legacy and lineage, and it really does come out of um, historical and aesthetic um, choices. Uh, you know, jazz musicians do this too. First, you know, if, if it's not your composition, you're starting with something mm. that somebody else composed. Yeah. That's right. And then you're doing your take on that. And if you're really good, it's pretty much a new, you know, a, a fresh new composition. And you know perfectly well, and maybe you resent it, but maybe you don't, that, you know, another, the next smart, clever, fabulous young musician who comes along is going to take something from yours, maybe a phrase, maybe, you know, um, and go with it. Yeah. yeah. Whitney Houston said, of, um, I will always love you. I mean, it was Dolly Parton, she wrote it. Which one you send that comment to the galaxy? Or as, oh, or as um, <laughs> Tina Turner said, um, I think when she was getting a little bit tired of um, all the Beyonce worship, because, you know, Beyonce mm -hmm. did the tribute to Tina Turner at the Kennedy Center Awards. And she said, there are a lot of little Tinas out there. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, brilliant. When it's edgy and totally truthful, right? Yeah, yeah, bliss, yeah, yeah. that's bliss. Yeah, we yeah. want a bit of edge. Yeah. Any, anybody else like to pose a question? Oh, great. Very simple. Nicole, yes. It's a kind of, I know, I just finished my stick. In your travels, in your travels, um, in your life, did you ever come across uh, Hazel Scott? Sure. Ah, um, can you tell did? us a little bit? Yeah. Uh, you know, I actually, um, I knew about her growing up and, you know, she was glamorous, she was talented, she was classically trained and she could play her own version, classical version of jazz. I'm, I, I wonder were history to have given her, were she have been born later, exactly what her choices would have been, I don't know. But, um, you know, she was extraordinary and she was very intelligent and she, and she was political and she didn't hold back on any of that, which is why she ended up in Europe. Uh, but she had a renaissance of a sort. It was a modest little renaissance, but it existed in the early 70s in New York. And Ms. Magazine asked me to do an interview, a kind of profile of her. So I actually did get to meet her. She also, you know, she'd lived through so much history, both as, you know, the woman, the wife, and as the musician. She'd been married to Adam Clayton Powell. You know, um, she had, again, you know, performed as a child prodigy, classical compositions, you know, and then she did movies. She, you know, she was, she never got quite the um, full scale, solid, you know, solidly grounded in we've got your, we've got your, we've got your back in the culture um, that she might have, I think, because um, she didn't fit exactly into any of these um, genres. And also she didn't, um, she was very attractive, but she didn't, um, she, she didn't try to charm except through her intelligence um, and her wit, you know, but she wasn't um, ingratiating in any way. Yeah, yeah. that Trini, <laughs> as I, uh, of course I'm gonna bring it in, she was not American, she wasn't born. Well, that's America. true. She, her not in Jamaica. That's right, she was. Yeah. That's right. And, and grew up in a household that was very Trini, you know, her mother okay. and grandmother. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. yes. And, and grounded in, um, you know, African culture as well Pakistan. as European culture. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, so she was a very sophisticated woman. And that was mm -hmm. a little complicated for well, the time. We do have time to get get on to Josephine Baker, um, where, <laughs> but can we just briefly touch on because she's, she's important to you, isn't she? You, you spent a lot of time thinking about her as a kind of cultural ambassador, um, someone who's and, a foreign body, but also she uses her body in a way that, that is going to serve her. Yes, exactly. She took so much. Oh yes. My phone is annoying. <laughs> no, no, no. It's necessary. I don't find it annoying. I find my poor little scarf annoying. Okay. It's a really no, but it's a nice scarf. No, I know. It's just not. It's not serving its purpose. Um, um, it was. 
you know, the cultural ambassador turned out to be, oh God, what were we talking about in the beginning? Um, impeccable and mm. desirable. She turned out to be, to, to first of all, she was always showing her own um, virtuosic pleasures mm. as a performer. You know, even when, you know, she staged this, I'm going to adopt, you know, this mm. international family yeah. that will show brotherhood. She wasn't, and, you know, she wasn't that interested in any of these kids, and there's no reason she should have been. But, you know, the grand scheme, um, and this not, not just impeccable, outrageous. You know, she would always turn something that could have been impeccable into a form of deeply compelling and, um, and, and also lighthearted. She could be very, you know, she could be serious, but she was playful, you know, mm -hmm. a great comic mm -hmm. artist in that way, but Malt always changing selves. I think in that way, you know, her, her ability to keep um, mutating, so to mm -hmm. speak, um, was something that I was, mm -hmm. you know, in my own way aspiring towards, mm -hmm. because, and also adapting from so many styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did every, you know, she did the Black Bottle. Um, she had um, dances choreographed for her by the ballet choreographer, George Balanchine. She sang Fats Waller. She sang, you know, she was a little French um, diseuse in her own way. Um, so yeah, she was everywhere. Mm. Um, well, that, stru that struck me also about your writing, that you are doing something very fresh and rewarding for me and novel, and people are gonna be trying to mimic you in the future. Um, what I got from when I was reading the book, I was thinking about that. There are a lot of little Margos out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking about that John Coltrane. John Coltrane was asked about the kind of jazz he's playing, and he said, uh, I'm playing the kind of jazz that the white man can't copy. Mm. Anyway, we're going to operate. Anywhere. We're going to close by thinking about mothers and grandmothers. Um, who are important to you. Um, yes. There's a line in your book towards the end where you say, you do not stop working to live up to your grandmothers. Your task is to justify their accomplishments by exceeding them. That sounds like your father sort of, doesn't oh, it? Yes, yeah. but you wrote it. I did write it. And, and I, I, wrote, um, um, I wrote it with a kind of awe and with great love and also from a kind of terror because that's, it's formidable. It's, <laughs> it's so much to um, aspire mm. to, to live up to and it can be merciless. Mm. Yeah, okay. and you can feel like you're, you're worshiping a kind of um, un, unapproachable goddess mm. as well as this creature you're intimate with. Well, I've been very delighted to be close to a, a diva that I admire. <laughs> <laughs> hugely, oh, and I want to write like her. Oh, uh, no, you don't! I do, know. I do, I do. I, I, I was, <laughs> you know. I'll be stealing from you in my next book. Do you oh. watch? You watch. Oh. Uh, uh, something, something the black man, <laughs> the, the black man can steal, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to, to embrace my feminine side as well. But uh, to, again, finally, towards the end, in fact, it might even be the last line. Um, you, you ask yourself, have you earned the right to be tired yet? Because those were my grandmother's last words on her deathbed. She said, I'm so tired, so tired. Mm. And I do. And then I said, I, yes, do you want me to? Do you answer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I, I imagine her saying she died when I was nine, um, um, you know, firmly, but, but with tenderness. Um, you haven't mm. yet earned the right to be tired. Donkey. She used to call me donkey. Mm. <laughs> That's the last word in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to the next book. And uh, <laughs> we've been enthralled. I speak for everybody. We've been enthralled by your writing and by this book, which is constructed in a beautiful way. Oh, a thank fantastic you. mosaic. Write a mosaic. Type mosaic. Way. I'm at my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, See, um, borrowing from each other. Uh, That's yeah. what we're doing. So, to, don't leave the, the house without a copy. And I want everybody to salute you as I do. Margaret Jefferson, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He's a magician too, isn't he? He's a ma